what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these constraints each week. We're going to take it apart. We're going to look inside of it. We're going to try to understand how does that constraint uh, um, present itself? How are different ways that people have, have suffered from it? What are things we can do to overcome it? And I'm going to use the language overcome a great deal to talk about a constraint and then talk about how to overcome it. And these stories, that the stories that I've collected in the book actually are ones that I'm going to share with you about how it is that people overcome these constraints. So now I'd like to take you on a quick tour of the class. Each week we're going to cover one of the following constraints followed by a wrap-up session that we're going to use to synthesize the whole thing. So we're an eight-week class. This is the first week. Week two will be the individual level, group, organization, and so on and so on. And so each week also, at the end of each week, I'm asking you to do is an in-depth diagnostic survey to help you determine the kind of constraints that you face at work. If you're working in the problem track, that is in the studio mastery track where you're actually working on an innovation project, you're going to be able to apply the constraints diagnostic to your actual pro project. And you should, it will generate uh, uh, information for you. It will help you with the project. If you're not choosing to do the, uh, the uh, studio mastery track, then what you're going to do is um, apply the diagnostic survey insights to your life, to what's going on for you in your daily life. Week one, we're going to start with the individual constraints. Individual constraints are really about individuals enlarging their tool set. How do we actually get to know uh, more different kinds of ideas? more different ways of thinking. I'll show you, I'll, I'll share this with you later. This is a Google Labs aptitude test. So Google wants creative people, and at one point they were using this as a job application screening device to find out who those creative people are. Look at question number eight. How many different ways can you color an icosahedron with one of three colors on each face? What kind of question is that? How is that a creative question? What colors would you choose? Well, maybe that's creative. And look at question number nine. The question of, um, this space left intentionally blank. Please fill it with something that improves upon emptiness. Oh, what do you put there? So how is it that these kinds of questions are something that could lead us to understand how to have better ideas, how to be more creative? Because remember, innovation starts with the idea, and somehow we're going to map this kind of thinking into creative ideas. Individuals, at this level we're going to be talking about um, how do we see things, um, how do we know things, uh, how do we understand things, and how things may help us. Because, in fact, if we're going to bring things into our life, if we're going to change our life around things, these are questions that actually have to be answered. The model we're going to use is a model of perception. If I want to be creative, I need to get new information in. Right? So if I have ideas, it comes from the stuff that's out there. So get new information in. We're going to talk about how to do that. In election, different ways of thinking about things. And then we're going to talk about expression, which is getting our ideas back out. Because you can have great ideas, but if they're stuck in your head, they do no good to anyone. They have to be able to come out. And so we're going to talk about these three things as ways of overcoming individual innovation constraints. The diagnostic, just to give you a brief uh, look at that, is broken into three parts. Perception, intellection, and then expression. And those are the kind of questions, this, the survey you actually do is going to be a sli slightly bit longer, but these are the kind of questions that you're going to do as part of your um, diagnostic to understand what's going on for you. Next, week three will be group constraints. We're going to talk about what goes on in groups. Groups are interesting in that in order for um, groups to share to help ideas become better, that it requires a certain amount of risk, actually. That we have to take some risk in, in a group in order to be able to um, make things happen. In fact, we have these things called a trust fall. So this is where you get people on a team together, they all uh, stand like this, and the person falls um, willingly backwards and, and trusts that the people are going to catch them. There's no net there they're going to catch them. What strikes me that, that I've often seen is that some people would rather do this trust fall and risk a skull fracture than share their ideas with other people in groups. Why would this be? They're afraid of being made fun of, maybe that what they're saying is taboo, maybe the kind of things that they're saying, um, that they're thinking, they don't think that other people would agree with them. These are all things that have to be overcome in order for innovation to uh, move forward. The kind of questions that go on in a group, and these aren't questions that are, that are conscious and obvious, but they're questions that nonetheless have to be answered. Now, how does this make me feel? If I'm with a group of people and I feel scared or I don't feel safe, that's problematic. Uh, groups will ask, is this how we do things? You know, yesterday we did this way. Why are we doing it this different way today? We have to answer that. What do I need to do? That's what people ask. I'm in a group of people. What do I need to do? How can I be productive? How can I help this group? Groups also wonder about goals. You're saying we're going to do something in a different way. You're making this proposition for change. Is it consistent with our goals? Is it where we're trying to go? You know, I joined this group to go here, and now you're saying we need to go there. And so again, what kind of questions we have to answer. The way we're going to think about it is we're going to talk about culture, culture in groups, and how groups sort of come to understand how it is they're together and what it is they need to do together. We're going to talk about emotion, what's going on emotionally for people in a group. 
when we're afraid, when we're, we're being criticized, what goes on there, what happens. We're going to talk about the environment within group, uh, within which groups operate. So are we in a room, or in a small room, or a big room? Are we, in a, uh, are we meeting virtually? Are we uh, in a place with whiteboards, with no whiteboards? All of these things tie into our ability to express our ideas to each other, to um, come up with new ideas, to um, document what we've done. And then finally, we're going to talk about process, the role of process. What do we do first, what do we do second, and what do we do third? Because certainly groups have to generate ideas, and certainly groups have to select ideas. These are very different processes, and if we try to do them at the same time, it becomes very problematic in groups, and we're going to see why that is. So here are the kind of questions you're going to have in the diagnostic, the kind of, kinds of things that we want to ask to understand. Is it invotion that's going to be problematic? Is it uh, the, the environment that's going to be problematic? Is it the culture of the group that's going to be problematic? Or is it in the, uh, the process that the group uses to get through the innovation that's going to be problematic? And so again, if we can isolate which one of these constraints is going to affect us, we're much more likely to become successful. Next layer we're going to talk about is the organizational layer, the organizational constraints. So organizational constraints, you know, are those things we know to be true about structure. How it is that we build the organization. Um, we're going to talk about, um, go back to the uh, case of the um, digital camera, the first digital camera. You know, what happened there? Why is it that Kodak was not able to capitalize on this thing? Well, maybe Kodak had a strategy to protect film. And this thing represented sort of the opposite of film. In fact, the digital camera is not film, right? So the film, and then we have film not. So the organization, of course, is not going to just drop everything and go do this. But we now know, you know, with retrospect, we should probably know that they probably should have paid some attention to it. And so there was some kind of strategic failure in this organization that did not allow them to see the value of this thing. And so we'll talk about how organizations think about strategy, how they do strategy, what should be there in order for us to in our organizations to put together an organization or to cause our organization to pay attention to ideas that are meaningful, that are strategic, and build a structure around allowing those things to happen. Organizations ask, you know, is this consistent with our strategy? In the case of Kodak, it was no. Is it within our capabilities? Can we do this thing? And in fact, in the case of the uh, first digital camera, the quality wasn't quite there, not as good as, it was, as film was, and so maybe they thought, this is not within our capabilities. Also, do we have the resources? And are we willing to put the resources to that kind of use? So we'll spend a lot more time with Kodak later. And the way we're going to think about it is structure. How is the organization structured? We're going to think about strategy. What are the different intentions? What's the strategic intent of the organization? And then we're going to talk about the resources, the kind of resources that the organization has and how it allocates them across the people in the organization. The diagnostics we're going to use are like these. We're going to try to talk about um, these three levels, the ones I just said, these three levels of, of constraint and try to say, is the organization within which I'm trying to innovate subject to these kinds of constraints or not, or is it going to be okay? Those three were what I'll call the internal constraints. So those are constraints that we have a little bit more control of, right? So what I do as an individual, how I generate ideas, the groups that I work within, even the organizations to a lesser extent, but still to some extent, I may have control over. I have a higher locus of control that is I can actually assert more control over those kind of constraints. The second set of constraints I want to talk about are what I'm going to call external constraints. So these are ones that are outside. Um, we're going to talk about the industry, society, and technology. Let's well, just quickly, the industry constraints. Indi industry constraints are about the market and how the market sees utility and value in our ideas. So when we make a proposition for change in the world, the market has to say, yes, that makes sense to me. I will change. I will adopt. I will think about it in a different way. So there was a proposition back in the day about uh, the music industry. So for example, in the music industry, at least in the United States, had a great deal. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the music industry was basically buy 12 songs you hate to get one song you like, and for about $20. And so this was, you know, people did it. I mean, you bought music, I bought music, we, we all bought music. But then this guy comes in into this market, so it's a market of, of, of organizations, and he writes a program, Napster, that basically trashes the whole thing. Because what is his proposition? His proposition is get all the music you want for free. Any song you want for free. Now, of course, it was illegal, and that's a problematic thing there. But my point here is that these companies, these record companies, knew about digital. They understood that what the possibilities were, but they didn't do anything about it. And so why would that be? Why in the industry you have all these different organizations, each organization behaving and making different kinds of assumptions about the world, but they couldn't get it together? And they didn't decide, they decided not to um, pursue this thing called digital, which allowed this teenager to basically destroy the whole thing. Why would that be and how does that work? So that's what we're going to look at. 
I want to ask some questions at the industry level of, you know, does this give us more power? By doing digital, do we get more power? Uh, is it fair? Do we expect our competitors to play fair? Are they going to do things that make sense? Does it take control from us? What does it take from us? What is it, you know, if I do digital now, what do I lose in the process? Also, industries are very uh, interested in what they can control. And so if I do an innovation, can I actually control it? Because if I can control it, I'm more likely to do it. But if not, I'm likely to suppress or try to um, avoid undertaking that innovation. We're going to talk about competition. That is what happens in a field of rivals. We're going to talk about suppliers, the people that give things, the, you know, the employees, the professionals, and, and what goes on there. Especially here, we're going to talk a lot about education. We're going to talk about health care. We're going to talk about politics and government. We're going to talk about those things that are very um, important for innovation but, and that happen at this level. And we're going to talk about markets and what goes on in markets. We're going to talk about disruptive technologies and lots of innovation things that you may have heard of before and situate it within this model that allows us to uh, generate power. Let me say that differently. By using this model, we're going to be able to diagnose problems of innovation and understand which way forward we should probably take. So industry level diagnostic which sort of breaks out in this way. We're going to talk about um, competition. We're going to think about how people compete. We're going to think about the suppliers, the kinds of, of uh, um, um, productive capacity, the raw materials that go in. And then we're going to talk finally about the, um, the markets and what goes on for the markets. The fifth level, societal constraints. What we know to be true is about society and how society has to say that thing is legitimate. And so we talked about human cloning and, and why it is that society says that's not a good thing. Society says there's potential for harm and so therefore it's, it's not safe. It's not our aspiration. We're not aspiring to have clones of all of ourselves. None of us uh, would believe the world would be a better place if everyone on earth were a clone of, of us ourselves. Also, when we look at innovations, we're talking about our identity. And we say, well, if I change my life around that, if I buy that Range Rover, if I buy that new iPhone, um, does that reinforce me to myself? Does that make me more of who I am? Does that make me better? Also, does this thing help us grow? Or does it help, or does it destroy us? So in either case, if it, we perceive it helps us grow, we're more likely to allow that innovation to exist among us uh, as a society. We're going to talk about values. Um, we're going to talk about social identity. We're going to talk about regulation and how it is that society stops things, because some, we have to be aware that society has power in, in terms of laws and things like that. We're also going to talk about history. What came before actually does create obligation for what comes afterwards. Because the world was the way once, doesn't mean that you can make it any new way again. And so we have to sort of acknowledge that history of what came before and, as we move forward. Societal level diagnostics, we're going to look and be able to ask these kind of questions like we asked of sow and grow. Right? Do people want it? Does it, is it? Do they identify with it? Do they aspire to it? Do they think it works um, um, in a positive way? Uh, is there a history behind this stuff that actually makes people um, less likely to adopt it? Or is the history something that allows them to adopt it? So we'll go into very gory detail about this and understand it. And finally, in week seven, we're going to talk about technical constraints. What it is that's hard. In this case, I'm not going to talk as much about, you know, we're talking about the development of the technology, I'm not going to talk about as much as like how do you do brain surgery, how do you keep that body alive, but the kind of things I want to talk about are, are sort of the, the, the um, way that we think about technology. You know, technology is, is, in a sense is easy, you know, does it work? The way we're going to think about that is um, knowledge. How, how much do we know about the technology? How much do we know about how the human body works, for example? So if we know more we know about it, the more likely we are to be able to drive an innovation that works. Also time. You know, think about windows of time. If you have a product and you're trying to sell lots of that product, maybe before um, a big holiday, you know, a Christmas holiday or, or a um, Easter holiday, some other, some, some big time when, when gift giving is important, well, there's a window of opportunity. And you have to have the, pro the innovation done during that time. So we'll talk about the nature of time and how it is that coordination, uh, windows of opportunity, those things actually matter and, and can be considered when we think about whether an innovation is going to work or not. And then finally, we're going to talk about the environment, like what goes on in the environment around us as we make innovations, as we make changes that may actually be adverse to the environment, that may actually pollute it, may kill us, may um, make, you know, make, make the world a, a worse place as a byproduct of our innovation. And sometimes we want to think about, will the environment actually support the existence of this innovation? And if this thing is successful, is that a good thing or a bad thing in the long run? And so we'll want to see that as well. Technology, we're going to ask these kinds of questions um, about what keeps 
functioning? What stops functioning from happening? Which one is it likely to do? Do we need to know more? Uh, do we need to think about timing more? Or do we think about, need to think about what this will do to the ecology, to the ecosystem within which we live? So, we're thinking about inside the box. We're not going to think about outside the box. So we're not even going to say that. We're going to think outside the box. It has nothing to do with what we're working on. What we're working on is trying to understand the constraints. We're going to understand which of these constraints we need to change in order to make our project successful. The project being the project I'm working on for this class, uh, the project of my life, um, the project uh, that I'm working on for my work, uh, the school project I'm working on, anything that's an innovation is going to be subject to these, and so we want to be able to diagnose which one of these things is the problem that we're going to get past. So with that, if you're in the project track, take a look at the project um, uh, brief description video. I have a small video there to talk about what I expect from the project and how it is you can get started if you have a team and all that. Um, if you're not in the project track, be sure to do the constraint, um, the, the diagnostic that I've asked you to do this week. Also be sure to do the, um, uh, re do the readings and watch the videos uh, in the rest of this week. All right.